Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining me again this evening. This evening, I'm going to be looking at the concept of radical acceptance. Now, I know I've talked about acceptance previously in some of these live streams. Tonight, I'm going to be looking at what's known as radical acceptance. Radical acceptance is a term that um, it's a term that Marsha Linehan, uh, the founder of DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, came up with. And it's a concept of accepting things we're really not comfortable with. We could be accepting even the things about ourselves we don't like. We could be accepting the situations we're in. We could be accepting, well, I'll go into a lot more detail. But tonight, uh, I'm going to do what I normally do. I'm going to be looking at what it is. I'm also going to look at what it isn't, what it doesn't mean. It's a very useful concept in being able to move forward. And I know I kind of paraphrase two of my favorite Carls a lot, but Carl Rogers and Carl Jung, you know, they talk about whenever I accept myself just as I am, then I'm now free to begin to change. Um, Carl Jung would talk about, again, to paraphrase him, um, when we accept something, we're now free to change something. But radical acceptance, it's like a, a it's a mindfulness based concept. Um, it's about fully embracing and acknowledging what's going on, what's going on with us, what's going on with the situation, maybe what's even going on with the other person, the people that hurt us in our lives and so on. No matter how difficult or painful it is, we accept it. When we don't accept it, it's like we're kicking against it. It's um, we're still trying to do something. We're trying to fix something. We're trying to change something. We're hoping, hoping this person will maybe treat us. The more we do, we can maybe take away those uncomfortable feelings, escape those uncomfortable uh, feelings that, that maybe hold us back, our anxieties, our stressors, our fears, things like that. What we're doing is we're accepting things and we're accepting it, if you will, without judgment and without resistance. What we're really doing is we're acknowledging it is what it is. It's not necessarily, as I often talk about acceptance, it doesn't mean we're okay with it. It doesn't mean we're fine with it. It doesn't mean we approve of it. It doesn't mean any of those things. Nor does it necessarily mean we're just going to roll over, we're going to surrender. It doesn't necessarily mean we're we're helpless. Hence the term uh, radical acceptance is about being radical about it. So you think of radical acceptance as a distress tolerance skill, if you want to put it that way. It helps us to increase our tolerance for distress. And I'll go into a bit more detail how we do that. But it's a way of increasing our distress so that the pain that we're in doesn't turn into long-term suffering. If you think of uh, even the concept of, uh, you know, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, when we accept something and we commit to do something. Okay, so when we accept that maybe there are some things that aren't necessarily within our control and i often think that our distress is caused by a lot of things that we really can't control now we cannot necessarily change or control other people we cannot change the past we can't change what's already happened there are some things we cannot change some things are maybe not ours to control maybe the most we'll ever do is influence them but even when we think of our own pain, our own distress, and the things that have happened to us, and the things that, that the, these things bring up in us, the, the pain these things bring up in us, the distress, the you know, the anxiety, the worry, the fear, the, even the anger, the resentment, all, all of those things. And I often think that, that human beings, you know, I include myself being a human being, um, whenever we feel something really deeply unpleasant, it's almost like the first thing we think of is what takes this away? What gets me out of this? How do I, how do I best avoid this? Whenever we accept just how we are, whenever we're able, if you will, to regulate, we, we, we understand what it is we're feeling. It's not we're just angry. It, we could be feeling threatened. We could be feeling devalued. We could be feeling something is really unfair. There's a huge lack of justice or, you know, unfairness. When we say anxiety, you know, uh, I feel a lack of control here. There's something really important to me and I have no control over it. Uh, I feel out of control or perhaps I feel as if I'm being controlled. Um, I feel uncertain. There, there's a lot of different things. Whenever we get a sense of what it is we're really feeling, whenever we pay attention to it, 
that can inform us. It doesn't necessarily have to make our decisions for us, but it can inform us. We can choose what might be in our, our longer term best interest. Sorry, I'm just going to turn this off here. There you go, because I just didn't want that going on for too long um, or making noises halfway through this. Whenever we accept, radically accept some of the things that would really not, uh, maybe rather not, we can find a way of getting unstuck from the unhappiness that we're in. Being a lot of people that um, come onto my channel, they've been in situations, they've been in relationships, maybe they've come from families, and there's been a lot of pain. There's been a, maybe a lot of mistreatment, and there's been maybe abuse, there's been a lot of different things. People have been treated very badly, very unfairly. And sometimes we can feel stuck. It, it can be very difficult for us to move on because a lot of the rumination that we do, um, a lot of the things that remind us of those people or remind us of those situations. When we radically accept, and again, I am going to go into more detail. When we radically accept some of the things that have happened, um, some of these people, they are what they are, that can help us become a little bit unstuck and help us to move forward. And I like using the term moving forward, which is very different from moving on. Two different things. People might struggle to move on. That's perfectly okay. And that's for a lot of different reasons. But moving forward is different because we can still move forward even when we're still feeling pain and we're still feeling uncertainty and fear and all those other things. But each and every time we do move forward a little bit, we're beginning to move on. So let's see. Let's look at what happens if we don't accept some of these things. Well, first of all, I think we're living in denial. Um, not necessarily denial these things have happened. Not necessarily these, these things have had the impact that they've had. But they could well have the impact of... Um, we stay stuck in the sense of... Let me start this again. You imagine you're in a situation with someone that's treating you really, really badly. And we don't really accept that they're not for changing. It doesn't matter what we do. Um, you know, we keep on complying. We keep on backing down. We'll give them what they want. We don't fight back too hard, but whatever it is. Um, we, we try to love them more. We try to reason with them, but no matter what we do, if we're not accepting they are what they are, then it's almost like we're in denial. We kind of stay stuck. We're hoping they get better. We're hoping things are going to change. We hope our lives are going to get better. Sometimes if we accept that they either can't change or they won't change because nothing else has worked up until now, you can't. I can't remember who phrased it, but I'm paraphrasing them. It's something I heard recently. Um, you can't reason, you can't love, you can't plead the toxicity out of someone. They are what they are. There are always exceptions, by the way. Some people can change, some people do. But sometimes you get these people and it's so deeply ingrained in them, nothing's going to change. And we can be in a state of denial the more we keep trying to, to bring out the best in them. Really, I think what we're doing is we're just kind of pacifying and we're placating and we're giving them what they want. When we're in that state of denial, even, even our own feelings, our own feelings of pain, hurt, resentment, bitterness, that, that anger we get when we feel something's really unfair, there's a lack of justice, the other person seems to have won. You know, maybe they get the house, they get a, a promotion, they get a pay rise, they seem to win. This can bring up a lot of stuff in us. Even accepting that sometimes the world can be hard and the world can be unfair. When we don't accept that, again, we can stay stuck. Very hard to move forward whenever we're stuck. And sometimes we can run ourselves into the ground trying to find a way out of whatever, wherever it is we're stuck. But we're still enmeshed in that moment. We're still uh, overthinking. We're still analyzing. We're still thinking about ways of what can I do to come out on top or what can I do to maybe change this? What we often end up doing when we're doing that is we end up living in a state of disappointment. That's not a pleasant thing. Um, we can live in a state of disappointment. It can feel sometimes it leaks into other areas of our lives. It feels as if nothing works out for us. Now, that's not necessarily true. There are always exceptions, but it can feel as if nothing works out for us. 
what we're going to do is we're going to feel a lot of pain, a lot of regret, as I say, a lot of disappointment, things like that. Acceptance, whenever we radically accept maybe the situation or maybe the things that have happened now, bear with me when I say this, we can still feel regret, we can still feel disappointment, and we can still feel a lot of emotional pain. But what we're doing is we're being honest with ourselves. We're just being honest with ourselves. No amount of overthinking is going to change what's already happened. No amount of maybe pleading or trying to love someone a bit more is necessarily going to change them. Even with that pain, what we can also get is a sense of clarity. Um, we're being a bit more realistic. If you will, we're being authentic. Now, again, a lot of people that watch my channel, they've been in situations, relationships with people with very deeply ingrained narcissistic traits. Now, if you notice some of those people, um, they find it very hard to accept anything, they, uh, anything that doesn't flatter them, by the way. They find it hard to accept that they're flawed. They make mistakes. They get things wrong. Um, they can be inappropriate. Sometimes their jokes aren't funny. They make poor decisions. They find that very hard to accept. Their their defense mechanisms are, are so maladaptive. It's, it's almost like um, they reject reality, if you will. Um, we can sometimes find ourselves in quite a similar situation. Rejecting the reality of, again, we can't rewrite things, we can't change them, we can't, we can't do that. Whenever we accept this, we're being authentic, we're acknowledging it is what it is, even when it's painful, even if we're not okay with it, it is what it is. We're acknowledging that it did hurt, we're acknowledging that it was real, we're acknowledging that maybe we did do our best, or at least we thought we did our best. We did our best with um, the information, the skills, the clarity, and all the rest of it that we have we're also acknowledging that when we look back at those situations we're all we're often judging ourselves through the eyes of the person we are today with the information we have today with the wisdom we have today with with the experience and all the rest of it we're judging ourselves through the eyes of the person we are today you know and it's like a therapeutic technique sometimes to to maybe ask someone, you know, if you could go back to that person, that child or that younger person or the person just as they went into that situation, you know, would you be judging them as being, you know, they're a complete stranger and you know what they're about to walk into? Would you be telling them that they're wrong, that they're foolish, that they're this, that and the other? Chances are you wouldn't be. But we often do that with ourselves, judging ourselves very harshly. So we, what we're doing is we're acknowledging, yeah, we have regrets, we have disappointments. There are times we turned left when we knew we should have turned right maybe every fiber in our body was saying turn right but for whatever reason we turned left it would, the other thing that can keep us stuck is and it can be difficult to accept is the thought of maybe someone who has hurt us going off and living the best life they have as i say they might get the house they might get access to the kids they might get you know all of the things get to keep the car they might get a promotion they might get a new partner they might do all of this and that feels really unfair because we're stuck right we bit of a sidetrack here that is true some people do when the world is not a fair place the world can be a, a very harsh place sometimes not always it can be but i'm a big believer in the law of the harvest okay um what I mean by that is it's that old expression, you reap what you sow. Whatever it is you sow, you're going to get the benefits of whatever it is you've, you've reaped. So people who have, you know, they've lied, they've cheated, they've been malignant, they've been toxic, they've been horrible, they have bullied. Yeah, it looks like they have won, and they probably have. But nobody ever wins for long. Nobody wins for long. Life is an ongoing series of things. It's not like a movie. There's a start and a finish and we all live happily ever after. Sooner or later, things catch up with people. And that includes them. Even if they do have all of the money or whatever, one way or another, we don't always see it coming. And we might not even be there to see it, by the way. But sooner or later, it catches up. Everything has a consequence. So 
just hold on to that thought of the law of the harvest. So looking again at the, at the concept of uh, radical acceptance. Looking at the difference between acceptance and approval, it doesn't mean you have to like it, okay? It doesn't mean you're fine with it, as I say. It's just about acknowledging it is what it is. Whatever it happened, happened. It, it exists, and it cannot necessarily be changed in the present moment. Remember, there are some things we cannot change. Maybe they're not ours to change, but that doesn't mean that we're helpless because there are some things we can change. We, we have control over ourselves. You know, there's... Um, I think if I if I'm right, and maybe someone will correct me, but I think it's in some of those like AA type groups to do what's known as the Serenity Prayer. Um, the, what is it? The the wisdom to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Not unlike three questions I often ask people, and these questions I did do a, a, a live stream on this a, a, a good while ago if you want to go back and look at it solution finding questions these can help with um, radical acceptance the first question is whatever it is can I change it what would change look like how would it feel what would you do with it even if you had it who would notice what would be different would it be better would it be worse would it just be different some things we cannot change, you look at what you can change. Can you change how you feel about something? You can't necessarily go from sad to happy. You can't go from angry to calm. But what we can do is we can, if you will, dilute some of those really intense feelings. Yeah. The example I often use is like somebody with a phobia, they don't like something. Um, in very small, safe, measured, voluntary ways, they expose themselves to the things they're comfortable they're uncomfortable with in little small tiny doses a little piece at a time and what happens is their tolerance for distress starts to increase they start to become more confident they start to um they start to become more courageous um, more resilient and that could take an afternoon that could maybe take a year or two there's no time limit and everybody's different we're all talking about different things so changing how you feel is not necessarily changing the feeling but it could be diluting it so that it doesn't necessarily hold us back next thing is well if you find it hard to change how you feel about something can you change how you think about it we all have thinking habits we all do it sometimes we leap to conclusions based on how we feel or past experiences we'll mind read we'll predict the future we'll catastrophize we'll always assume the worst when you get a sense of how you are thinking, you can cognitively reframe that. You can look for evidence for or against. You can explore alternatives. The last one is, even if that's difficult, well, can you change how you behave towards it? Those three things are linked, by the way. Thoughts, feelings, behaviors, they're all linked. One small change in just one of those areas, being consistent, you begin to see a knock-on effect in the other two. For instance, someone who struggles with assertiveness, Again, they might to change how they feel about it, expose themselves to little things where they might practice saying no. But changing how they behave about it, well, that could be changing how you carry yourself. Um, you know, you stand with your back straight, you make eye contact, you speak clearly, rather than looking at your feet and mumbling. You're changing how you behave. So there are different things you can change. You can even change your approach if what you're doing doesn't work. I always remember an old lecture, I always quote an old lecture of mine, he says, if it didn't work the third time, why do you think it's going to work the tenth? If it's that important, you change your approach. So there are different things we can do when it comes to acceptance, which leads me on to the next of those three questions. Can I accept it? Remember, doesn't mean we're okay with it. Acceptance can also mean, it can also mean, maybe i have to accept it for now because maybe something can change at some point in the future you know i accept that i'm alone but i accept it for the moment i I'm, don't necessarily have to be alone forever i accept that i don't have a job but i don't have a job right now doesn't mean i'm not going to get one i could start applying i could start looking i could update my cv not everything has to be a, a permanent state okay but the last question as well is, can I just leave it alone? Can I let it go? Not necessarily an easy thing to do. 
But sometimes all we're saying to ourselves is, I have wasted far too much time on this. This has taken up far too much of my time, far too much of my resources. This has eaten away at too much of me. This has actually held me back. Um, so we decide, it's not that we've forgotten it. It's not that it doesn't matter, not that it doesn't hurt, doesn't mean any of those things. Sometimes we're just saying, I will not allow it to consume any more of me. It's holding me back. When we decide to let something go, or if that's the term you want to use, we decide to let something, something go. Sometimes maybe we've just accepted it. And when we've accepted it, we're now free to change. Those three questions are all linked. I really do go off on some tangents sometimes, don't I? I didn't mean to go on to that. But anyway, those three questions can help with acceptance. Can I change it? Can I accept it? Can I just let it go? Not unlike the serenity prayer. That's how I got on to it. Not unlike the serenity prayer I mentioned a moment ago. A little bit of mindfulness can help as well. Some people practice mindfulness. Um, that's about being a bit more present, acknowledging things without judging them. Um, your thoughts, emotions, sensations, even physical sensations. We notice our urges and things like that. There's there's meditations, there's guided meditations, there's I think there's podcasts, there's there's YouTube videos, there's things people can download. I think there's even apps for the phone. Um, a lot of different things. A little bit of mindfulness can help. Practicing acceptance maybe just in a moment. So I'm say the more we become familiar with something, sometimes the easier it is to practice whenever we really need it. The letting go, a uh, little bit of letting go. There are different ways we can do this. Sometimes things have really hurt us. Sometimes what we can do, different things, there's a very uh, gestalt kind of method where we, uh, maybe a therapist would be talking to you. It's what's known as the, um, what's known as the empty chair exercise. And that's just, you, ma you imagine whoever it is has hurt you. They're sitting in the chair and you have a conversation with them. You tell them whatever it is, it's on your heart, whatever it is, is on your mind. You tell them maybe what you think of them. You tell them maybe the impact of what they did. You tell them how much better off you are. You, you have whatever conversation you want with them. You tell them what they need. They are not necessarily there. They're not going, you know, they're not necessarily going to hear you. You're not going to get hurt. You can tell them whatever you want. If you want, take it a bit further. Have the conversation with them. You imagine what they would be saying back to you. And it doesn't matter what they say back to you. They could be acknowledging you. They could be apologizing. Or they could just be their usual nasty self. You are in control. Another way could be maybe writing it all out. Some people maybe like write letters or they write a journal, they write whatever, they write everything down that bothers them. What they do with that afterwards, they shred it, they burn it, they get rid of it, it's gone. Another thing you can do when it comes to writing down um, to let go, sometimes we write down we write down the things that really really frighten us the things that really bother us the things we fear are going to happen and we think we're not enough to be able to handle them whatever it is they're going to wipe us out you know they're we're, we're going to be annihilated this is going to be catastrophic you write it down on paper you be as creative as you like you just write it all down when you finish that just take that page fold it up put it in your back pocket put it in a drawer put it somewhere no one's going to read it it's yours you know just just put it away but then come back to it later on, maybe a few hours later, maybe a day or two later, and then read it back to yourself. And notice that what you're reading doesn't have the impact that it had when it was in here. I often say human beings have a head like a TARDIS. It's always so much bigger on the inside. Once it's out there, it's on that paper. You read it back, as I say, later on. It doesn't have the impact that it had. So pardon me whether or not you have that conversation in the empty chair whether or not you uh, write them the letter and then destroy it whatever whether or not you write down your fears or whatever what you're doing is you're signifying your willingness to accept the situation you're acknowledging there's maybe no more than than you can actually do you're getting it at that TARDIS type head we have you're getting it out of your head and you're putting it out into the real world only to get rid of it later, only to destroy it later. The other thing is to, as I said earlier on about regulating our emotions, first of all, we have to acknowledge them. Um, 
a lot of people, and I'd say this is a societal thing, um, not necessarily just being in a, a, a difficult uh, relationship or environment. It's almost like there's something wrong with us for feeling something. And there isn't. Our feelings are normal. They're natural. They're, I don't even know what the right word is. They're inherited. They're, they're you know, something deep in us. That being said, our feelings aren't always an accurate reflection of what's really going on. They, if we're not regulating them, we could feel anxious. But that anxious turns into this dread, this fear. So whatever it is, we try to avoid it. When we acknowledge it, yeah, I could just feel uncertain. Um, I need to be alert. I need to be on my toes. I need to be ready for this. Or, you know, I'm stressed. Well, that's because I need to focus on this. This needs my attention. But it might not necessarily need your attention 24 hours a day. We just do those little bits at a time. So we acknowledge what it is we're feeling. We actually name it. Uh, we, we go as far as we can with it. You know, if, even if we can't find a name for it, we describe it. It doesn't matter. Um, there's nothing wrong with us for feeling what we feel. You know, I feel annoyed. I feel embarrassed. I feel humiliated. I feel frustrated. I feel what whatever it is. We're acknowledging what it is. In other words, we're accepting it and we're not kicking against it. We're not trying to deny it. We're not pushing it out of the way. We acknowledge it for what it is and we allow that to inform us. For instance, if I'm frustrated, why am I frustrated? Well, I'm frustrated because no matter what I try to do, we'll change this. Well, maybe it's not yours to change. It takes us back to the beginning. Or um, I feel really frustrated because this feelings, the feelings that I'm having, you know, whether they're embarrassment or guilt or shame or whatever, they are deeply unpleasant. Yes, they are. Absolutely. No one can tell you that they're not. However, even feelings like that, when we regulate them, can regulate our behavior because I will not be in that situation again. I will handle it differently should it ever arise again. Um, we, we learn from them. Another thing that can help is, again, when we look at things like the regret that we have, when we look at maybe um, the disappointment we have, when we look at time wasted, money wasted, you know, years wasted sometimes. When we look at things like that, sometimes, again, we're giving ourselves a hard time. I should have known, like, what well, I'm clairvoyant or something. Um, you know, I should have been able to. Well, why? When have you ever had to do that before? Again, judging ourselves through the eyes of the person we are today. Something that can help is accepting the fact that maybe you are in pain, whatever that pain is, you are in pain. But you talk to yourself and you treat yourself as if you're someone that you deeply care about someone you don't want to see hurt, someone you want to bring out the best in, someone someone that needs a hand up. You, And even if that can be difficult, you know, look at it this way. Imagine you are, treat yourself as if you are someone you are responsible for looking after. Sometimes we look after people and we might not necessarily get on with them, but we still look after them. We still perform our duty. We still do our job, things like that. So you treat yourself as if you're someone you really care about or you treat yourself as if you're someone you are responsible for. Another thing that can help, we often think in terms of, you know, looking at our pains, our weaknesses, our deficits, our regrets. It's also important to accept our skills, our qualities, our achievements, even if they were things that other people would scorn or ridicule or give you a hard time over or try to take away from you. Um, you acknowledge those and they do not have to be anything magnanimous. They do not have to be brilliant. You don't have to find a cure for something. You don't have to be the first person on Mars. You don't have to invent something absolutely wonderful. They could be anything. Um, you pass your driving test. You got a new job, you got a pay rise, you got a promotion, you have accomplished something, you have learned something new. They don't have to be anything amazing, don't have to be anything brilliant, they don't have to be anything huge. But simply acknowledging your strengths, your qualities, your achievements, your skills. <coughs> Pardon me. We're very, very quick, I think. We're very quick to to rubbish them. No, sometimes we just need to acknowledge them. You know, I might not necessarily like whatever it is, but I actually happen to be quite good at it or I happen to be 
you know, um, quite accomplished in it. I would have pre preferred to have went in that direction, but I'm actually pretty good at what I'm doing here. Acknowledging those things can help again with things like the self-compassion. It can help with things like self-soothing. Um, self-soothing, yeah. Doesn't again doesn't have to be anything massive. You don't have to book a month in the sun or something. Um, hot bath, cup of coffee, chocolate picky with your tea, whatever it is. Um, just little things like that can help. Can help you to acknowledge even just the quiet little things you enjoy, the quiet little things that you benefit from, quiet little things you're good at. Whatever it is, you pay attention to those things. No. The other thing about acceptance is, and this is, can be a very difficult thing, and that's change. Change isn't always easy. Sometimes change, well, um, I think it was Ericsson said, yeah. Change is constant. It happens all the time. Change is one of those things that sometimes it happens and we have to keep up with it. We have to adapt. Um, we have to maintain certain things. We, Other times... Change is something we have to initiate. We have to figure out what that change is, first of all. But when we acknowledge, you know, whatever that change is, and whenever we um, take some kind of action to change something for the better, and we're maintaining it and we're sustaining it, that isn't necessarily always easy. But like I said earlier, with the thoughts, the feelings, and the actions, being consistent and paying attention to the small little changes that you notice in yourself along the way can help you get that little bit further on if you're talking about a road to recovery and a road to recovery it can also help us to uh, recognize we we're a bit more resilient than we often give ourselves credit for we think often think the first sign of an obstacle and that's it um you know the first thing that comes up well there you go there's our plan scuppered no our resilience is our ability to look at the problem be able to navigate around it or even just push it out of the way it's not even a problem um sometimes it, it might actually be a stepping stone to get us to where we need to be we can be more courageous and more resilient than we give ourselves um credit for sometimes so let me see where are we next yeah. Marsha Linehan, who came up with the concept of um, radical acceptance, when, it, when she came up with the concept of, of DBT, she talked about 10 steps to, to practice in order to help with radical acceptance. They were just some of my ideas, but I'm going to talk you through her. You may be better hearing these from her because she's the one that came up with the concept. And these are the things that she suggests would be helpful. So the first one is you observe, you observe that you're either questioning or you're fighting reality. You're talking about things like it shouldn't be this way. Well, in an ideal world, maybe it shouldn't. But as I say, the world is not ideal. It's not always fair. So you observe what is actually going on with you. You know, why is something painful? Why is something hurtful? Why is something overly stressful? Why is something deeply unfair? You know, you pay attention what that means to you, what that's bringing up in you, okay? Their second point is to remind yourself that an unpleasant reality is just as it is. We can't necessarily change it by overthinking it. We can't change it by trying to rewrite it. Um, an unpleasant reality is something that necessarily can't be changed again something from the past we can't really write that it doesn't matter how many times we ruminate over it we're still going to get the same answer i think whenever we are ruminating it's just my thoughts human beings don't like things that don't make sense we like to see cause and effect rhyme and reason we like to see we like to see the good guys win we like we like things to make sense we like to see patterns we don't like things that don't make sense and whenever we're overanalyzing something, a conversation, or a series of interactions, an environment, a situation we were in, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to fill in the blanks. We're trying to um, we're trying to get ourselves information we don't have, and even accepting that sometimes the only way we're ever really going to know is maybe if someone else tells the person themselves tells us. 
chances are they're not going to. So reality is maybe just as it is, it cannot be changed. This is what happened. This is where I am. This is the, the impact of it. You remind yourselves, her third point is reminding yourselves that there are causes for the reality. This is how it happened. Now, this is similar to something I, I think I've said it in a previous post, or maybe it was a video. I was talking about rumination. A lot of time when we're um, a lot of time when we go over things, we're asking why? Why this? Why are they like this? Why did they do that? Why did I why did I do this? What what's wrong with me? We keep asking why, why, why? Different questions to ask, maybe about the same thing, is how did this happen? When did this happen? Where did this happen? When we're asking different questions like that, we, well, we might get a little bit further. We're becoming a little bit more informed. Uh, maybe our thinking becomes a little bit more constructive. We're not necessarily stuck in the, again, the why, why, why. If we keep asking ourselves why, the only person that can tell us is the other person. Where even when we're asking ourselves, why did I do this? Or why was I thinking this? Or why was I in that situation? Again, how? when where things like that it's just a different way of thinking about the same thing practice ex her fourth point practice accepting with your whole self now that's your mind your body and your spirit that's all of you um we feel things physically uh, things have an impact on us they can change our belief systems there's a lot of different things go on so you um you pay attention to your whole self, your mind, your body, and your spirit. Use accepting self-talk. As I said earlier on, things like self-soothing, a little bit of the mindfulness, like relaxation techniques, whatever they are. Um, some people find imagery. Some people find sounds comforting, whatever it is. These little things that can help de-escalate us in, in a moment. Her fifth point, she talks about listing the behaviors that you would engage in if you did accept the facts, so you list down the behaviours that you would engage in. Now, if you, uh, as I say, it could be moving forward. Well, maybe I will. Uh, maybe I will uh, enrol in a new course. I will learn a new skill. Maybe I will move to a different area. Maybe I will get a whole new circle of friends. I'll make new relationships. When you write down the behaviors that you would engage in, you know, I would be a bit more assertive, I'd be a bit more funny, a bit more lighthearted. Once you've got that list, what she suggests is you engage in those behaviors as if you've already accepted. Think about what I was saying earlier, changing your, your feelings, your thoughts, or your behaviors. What she's suggesting here, I think is, when you think through the behaviors you would be doing, then you start engaging in it. So in other words, you're changing your behavior and notice the knock on effect that will have in your thoughts and your feelings as well. Her sixth point is you imagine in your mind's eye, believing what you do not want to accept and rehearse in your mind what you would do if you did accept what seems unacceptable. I'm gonna read that again. Imagine in your mind's eye, believing what you do not want to accept OK, whatever that might be, being treated unfairly. You don't want to accept you were treated unfairly. And rehearse in your mind what you would do if you did accept it. Similar to the last one about engaging in the behaviours. So this is looking at how you would, how you would maybe think a bit differently. Maybe you would be a little more cautious, not necessarily fearful. Um, Maybe you would be open to a bit more information before making a choice. Maybe you would be prepared to um, take things a step at a time rather than allow yourself to be rushed into something. Could be a lot of different things. Number seven is you attend to your body sensations as you think about what you need to accept. A moment ago, I was saying about how we feel things physically as well. For instance, we know when we're stressed, we maybe get knots in our stomach, or we know when we're nervous, we get butterflies in our stomach. We get different things like that. So you pay attention to the body sensations. For instance, when we're angry, we might be very restless. When we're excited, oh, we might not be able to sit still. So you think about the body sensations that come up for you. If you're if you're still thinking about the things you're finding hard to accept, 
Think of the body sensations there as well. Pay attention to those. But without forcing anything, notice the difference whenever you start to think about what you need to accept. It, maybe as if you have accepted it. You imagine, again, this is a solution-focused exercise. I'm just going to sort of crowbar in here. Um, you get an idea of where you would like to be maybe in a year's time or five years' time. And then you imagine it as if you already have it. You know, I, I want that job. Well, you imagine what it's like if you have that job, or I want to be in a place of my own, or I want to be in a new relationship. I want to be with this group of friends that are going to be, you know, this, that, and the other. You imagine what it would be like, say, a year from now, five years from now, whatever it happens to be, whatever your goal is, you imagine what that would be like. And you talk to yourself, it's going to sound a bit weird talking to yourself, but you talk to yourself as if you already have it. As if you're already doing it, as if you're already there. For instance, let's imagine I want that job. That job would be amazing. You know, that would pay my rent, my mortgage, whatever. And, you know, I'd be able to advance and I'd feel good and I'd have friends and so on. Okay, so you talk about what it's like to have that job. You talk about, well, the interview was difficult, but I was able to answer the questions. Um, and I've been in the job for X amount of time now. Um, yeah. It's a good company they do this they do that they offer the other thing i've made a few friends um it's it's a good culture you know things like that you're talking about it it is kind of a, using your imagination it's maybe like fantasy thinking but bear with me when you get a sense of imagining what it's like if you already have it pay attention to what you're feeling sometimes we can feel a bit more confident we can feel a bit more energetic we can feel a bit more at rest. Sometimes the tension in our joints starts to ease. Sometimes the knots in our stomach start to shift. Then when you've done that, when you've acknowledged that, it's almost like, right, you come back into the present, okay? You jump into your time machine, you come back to the here and now. So you pay attention to what that would be like. That can give you the energy you need to get a step closer to where you want to be. Because a lot of the time, it's the, the, the emotional as well as the physical that kind of can keep us stuck. So you pay attention to those body sensations. Her eighth point is to allow disappointment, sadness, grief, whatever it is, allow that to arise up in you. Again, they are not nice feelings, but the more we kick against them, you know, when we kick against them, I think what we're actually doing, one of two things, we're internalizing it. And when we internalizing it, um, different things start to happen. They can become a lot bigger. We'll feel them physically. Sometimes they leak out into other areas. Um, the anxiety, the depression, that can increase. Um, our tolerance for any kind of distress or difficulty, that might start to come down. Or if you think of some of the people in your life that have hurt you, they start to get projected outwards. You know, um, you have a hard day at work and you throw a stone at the neighbor's cat on your way home when you see it in your driveway. The cat had nothing to do with it. That's not going to fix anything. And if your neighbor catches you, you're in trouble. You acknowledge those feelings. Again, whenever you acknowledge the feelings, the sadness, the disappointment, the grief. Remember, um, in relationships and things like that, a lot of the time we don't just grieve the relationship. We grieve the relationship we would have liked to have had. We don't grieve the person we don't necessarily miss the person we miss the version of them that we fell in love with um all of our disappointments and things like that we grieve we grieve the version we would have liked to have had we grieve lost time we grieve the the money the energy all of the things it's not nice but you acknowledge those feelings um the more we try to suppress them the more we try to suppress them um well, they have to come out somehow. They're going to come out somehow. And it can have such an effect on us. Again, they can affect not just our moods, but even our decision-making. Her ninth point, and I think it's a very powerful point, is to acknowledge that life can be worth living even where there is pain. Absolutely. And, you know, the way I phrase it, and I've said this in previous live streams, difficult is not impossible. It's not the same as impossible. Not now is not the same as not ever. Again, sometimes when we accept something, we maybe just have to accept it for the moment. 
because maybe we cannot change it at the moment. So we look at maybe what we can change. And it doesn't always have to be the way it is now. Sometimes when we feel stuck, we think, well, this is my life now. No, not necessarily. Uh, another um, quote from Carl Jung, uh, it's one of my favorites. And when it's quoted, usually only half of it's quoted. Um, but the bit that's always quoted is, I am not what happened to me. And that's a very powerful thing, and I would agree with that. But the full quote is, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Okay, so, yeah, even whenever we are struggling at the moment, it doesn't have to be like this forever. Her tenth point, do pros and cons if you find yourself resisting, practicing acceptance. You do the pros of it, and you do the cons of it. What do you get out of accepting something? Remember, accepting it doesn't mean you're okay with it. It doesn't mean you're just surrendering to it. It doesn't mean any of those things. Um, remember, it could be you're you're not fine with it, it not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, what are the consequences if you don't? I can't tell you what they are. It could be anything. Um, more often than not, though, I believe it keeps us stuck. It keeps us stuck, uh, again, in, the, in, in terms of maybe being in a, a narcissistic abusive relationship. It keeps us stuck believing. I think there's something in us that we believe that only they can fix us. Only they can set us free. Only they can apologize. Only they can do this. Really, what we're doing is we're allowing them to live around free in our heads. Um, it's almost like we're dependent on them for them to fix what they have done. If we don't, um, if we don't accept, as I said, they 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 are what they are, and it's not just me. It's not just you. It's not. They'd be like this with anyone. Um, but I'm going to leave you with something I said earlier because we can find it very hard uh, to sometimes accept even someone the way they are. Think about what I said earlier about the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. The harvest the harvest doesn't necessarily come first thing in the morning. It doesn't even come maybe this time in six months, but sooner or later it comes because everything we ever do will have a consequence and everything we don't do will have a consequence. Maybe we need to choose our consequences. Even if they're painful in the short term, they can lead to longer term growth, gratification, whatever word you want to use. People with that narcissistic mindset, um, they tend to make decisions that are based pretty much on how they feel in the moment. What makes them look good? What makes them feel good? What gives them you know, superiority and, and all the rest of it? A lot of their decisions are very, um, I would say, poorly thought through a lot of the time. Sometimes it's Sometimes we think we're dealing with Hannibal Lecter, when in reality, I think we're dealing with Wiley e. Coyote. That's sometimes the level of, of the people we're dealing with. That being said, they can still be they can still be quite toxic and dangerous. So, you know, be careful. Um, so remember the law of the harvest. Even if someone does win, no one wins forever. So I'm out of breath after going through that. I don't get a breath. This is different from being in a session with someone because Usually they do most of the talking. So I'm going to have a look at some questions that came through. Uh, Drusilla, I think it's easier with lower expectations and looking for the positive in any situation. I, I would agree with some of that. Yes, uh, I would say about lowering our expectations. Well, if I put it to this way, realistic expectations. Um realistic expectations there's a difference between meeting and managing expectations um if if we are constantly trying to meet expectations sometimes those expectations are they're difficult they're impossible it's like again trying to please someone who can't be pleased or you know trying to reason with someone who can't be reasoned with or trying to get through to someone who refuses to listen um maybe manage our expectations there um, looking for the positive in any situation. Yeah, I'm all in favor of that. But again, I think it's about balance. Um, big believer in balance. If we only ever look at the negative, 
we are ignoring things like growth. We are ignoring things like opportunities. We're ignoring things like our resources, our support network, our opportunities, all, all of those things. If we only ever look at the positive, well, maybe we're in denial. I can't put it any other way than that. Maybe we're just in denial. So it's trying to find the middle path. It's like I said earlier, um, impossible is, or difficult is not the same as impossible. Difficult might take us a bit longer to get there. It might take more of our resources and so on, but it's trying to find that balance. It just means we're going to get there a bit longer. There are still positives. So just a little bit of balance. Okay. Uh, good morning, Six Sense Amelia. Um, Mylene, acceptance is a good word. It is a good word. I think it's a difficult word sometimes. There are some things we would rather not accept. Um, just like I say, when we accept it, doesn't mean we're okay with it. And again, if you think of what I said earlier, uh, as Carl Rogers says, whenever I accept myself just the way I am, I'm now free to change. As Carl Jung said, well, again, paraphrasing him, <laughs> When we accept something, we're now free to change something. Okay. So it can be a good word. Uh, T. Cancella, thank you for these videos. You're very welcome. I do hope you find something helpful in them. Uh, just because you have a thought doesn't mean it's true. You're absolutely right. Um, I don't remember who said this, but I've been saying it, I've, I've said it quite a lot over the years. Don't believe everything you think. <laughs> so you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Lorraine says, radical acceptance is the willingness to let go of the illusion of control, to accept things just as they are in this moment without judgment. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's acknowledging it. It's, um, it's identifying it. It's acknowledging it. Um, the illusion of control. Yeah. Every single one of us need some kind of control. We all need a level of control. We, we need to be able to control ourselves sometimes. You know, we don't want to fly off the handle or whatever. Um, we also, we need to know where we're going to sleep tonight. We need to know where our next meal is coming from. So we all do need to have some level of control. The illusion of control. Um, yeah, like I can control my environment. I can control the world around me, um, what people think of me, what they're going to say. Yeah, it's letting go of that. Um, I can control my emotions. Well, we can to a degree, but we can't stop feeling them. We, it doesn't mean that we're not going to have emotions. We're not going to have feelings. As I said earlier, I, I think it's different from thinking and behaving because we're taught how to think and how to behave. Um, feelings are different. As I said, sometimes they're not an accurate reflection of what's really going on. If we're not really regulating them, we need to pay attention to them. Um but yeah, it's it's letting go of that illusion of control. Accept things as they are in this moment without judgment. Yeah, we acknowledge it. That's all we're doing. We observe it. Okay. So on my way says great quote. Not quite sure what the quote was, but I'm glad you liked it. The full version of the quote makes more sense. Oh, the the um the Carl Jung one. Yeah, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. It's usually only the first half of that that's quoted, and I don't know why. Um, I, I think the whole thing makes a lot more sense. So what I learned from Marshall in it, it takes two years to takes around two years to complete DBT, but it's so beneficial. Um, yeah, it's it's something. It's not it's not a therapy that I practice, but it's something I would use some of the concepts from it. Um, some of you know such as the grounding a little bit of the mindfulness trying to de-escalate things uh, in order to be able to move forward the acceptance of things i i would use those questions from earlier you know can i change it can i accept it can i just let it go um it, it is a it's it's a very uh it's a very good um it's very good uh, model of working it seems to have quite a high uh, success rate if, if you look at some of the research um Wiley never wins. <laughs> yeah, Wiley Coyote never wins. But this is the thing about Wiley Coyote, as comical as he is. My 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 um funniest memory of Wiley Coyote is just as he was about to do something chasing the road runner, you know, doing whatever. And he finds himself on the edge of the cliff. And just as he's about to plunge, he just looks at the camera and he holds up a little sign saying they don't pay me enough for this, you know, before he plunges. <clears throat> Wiley Coyote is a ridiculous character. 
but he is relentless. He keeps on going. And the thing about him is he never learns. He just keeps doing the same things again and again and again, no matter how many times they blow up in his face. And that's why I say sometimes some of the people we're dealing with are a bit like Wiley kind. But that being said, it doesn't mean that they're harmless. It doesn't mean that there's, you know, there's no danger in them. It just means that they're nonsensical. They just keep on going. Um, does making a decision to stay in a marriage just for the challenge where your relationship with spouse is your own considered drugs? A radical acceptance. Uh, I think about this question. Uh First of all, I'm going to be very general because I can't really answer specific questions about specific situations. So I'm going to be very, think about this and try to be general. Making a decision to stay in a marriage just for the child, if the marriage is irreparable, considered a radical acceptance of living miserable for the rest of your life. It could be. Um, if you decide to stay in, in that environment, it, it could well be if someone were to do that. Um, there, it doesn't necessarily mean there aren't other things that could change. Um, there are things we can do. We can change our approach. We can change a lot of different things. Um, the last point that Marshall Linehan had made was doing the pros and cons. Um, she talked about doing the pros and cons if you find yourself resisting practicing things like that or find it difficult with acceptance. What I would say is, and this is something to talk over with maybe a therapist, um, you explore you explore the options, the consequences of leaving and the consequences of staying. Um, and then you make your choice. Fortunately, I can't make it for you. I um, can't really say much more than that. Again, it's very difficult to answer um, real life things. I uh, don't know anything about DBT. What is it? A dialectal, dialectical behavioral therapy. It's a it's a form of therapy. It's it's proved quite um, popular with different kinds of traumas, uh, with trauma, with anxiety, with stress. Um, it seems to be getting a lot of ground. A lot of people with borderline personality have, have uh, reported finding it, it helpful. Um, I think about a year or two ago, I did a video on DBT. Yeah, I did. Um, it, in the, I have a playlist of different therapeutic approaches. You'll find one on DBT. If you have a look at it, it'll give you a bit more information. Okay. Okay, doing the pros and cons list. I already know the cons are going to win. You already know the cons are going to win. Well, there you go. You've already made your list. Um, well, folks, I'm pretty much at the end of the time tonight. I do hope you find tonight helpful. You'll find a lot more stuff online. Um, Marshall Linehan, you'll find uh, websites with her stuff on it, the stuff about DBT. Radical acceptance, again, what it is, what it isn't. You might get information out there. I just whiz through this in an hour, just waffling away. Um, if you get it down in, on writing, some of the points and things like that, some of the exercises, you might find them helpful. Um, you think about the difficulties when we don't accept things. Um, again, we can end up feeling stuck. We can be in denial. We can uh, live rather than be disappointed it's almost like we live in a state of disappointment um i'll leave you with this thought and i'll keep saying that accepting something doesn't mean that it's okay bear with me a moment i'm just trying to think of how to articulate this <laughs> It can be one of the most difficult things we'll ever do to accept something that really, really hurts. Really, really hurts. It can be one of the most difficult things we'll ever do. It can also be one of the most liberating. Again, you're not necessarily going to get this listening to me waffling on for about an hour. It's something that you might want to practice or maybe talk to your therapist about or maybe talk to your therapist about it or there's a lot of information online. Um, 
And even if we do accept the things that really, really hurt, say it doesn't mean we're okay with it. But we can also look at the other things. There is a concept that's known as, um, the, well, they call it traumatic growth, but it's one of the things that we get from our pain, such as we can become a bit more compassionate, we can become a bit more um, empathetic, we can become not overly cautious, but we can become cautious. We're not going to rush into things. So we can become a bit more thoughtful. There's there's a lot of different things that can come out of, of, of the pain we cause. Some people uh, have used the pain that they have experienced in their lives to go on to do other things. Maybe they want to help other people. They might go into counseling, they might go into nursing, they might go into something, care work. Um, some people want to write books, they want to tell stories, some people want to campaign for something, they want to bring about some kind of change. So there are different things that come, come from it. So, <laughs> Darren McGee, I love your accent, so cute. Do you know, I've often said, um, I didn't know I had an accent until I heard other people speak. Mm. <laughs> uh, Activism, I suppose it could be, it depends on the kind of activism. Um, trying to change something for the better, not trying to change something just for the sake of changing something. Maybe I'll put it that way. Uh, okay, everybody, until next time, that's going to be me for tonight. I need to get my cup of tea and my chocolate biscuit. Um, Next time, I'm going to be on a Sunday, so that's going to be 10 days from now. Now, I did say that I would uh, put it out and I would ask people um, what what they would want to talk about, but I just had this idea because someone had asked that, someone had asked about radical acceptance, and honestly, it must be about a year ago, and I do feel really guilty. I ask people to suggest things, and then I don't get around it for a long time, which I try to answer as many questions in the one video as I can. I don't always get it done. Um so I thought that would be a topic worth covering. Um, as I say, there's uh, other videos on YouTube where people talk about it a bit more specifically. You might find people who even practice DBT, uh, mindfulness, things like that, um, might be able to give you a lot more information. There's uh, websites out there. Uh, if you look up Marsha Linhan, you'll find uh, a lot of her work. Um, you'll find the, the, quite the, the points that I went through tonight. You'll find those. I do hope you find them helpful. In 10 days' time, I will put it out again on that uh, I'll be doing a live stream. And anybody wants me to talk about something within reason, as long as I know what it is or I don't have to look up too much about it, um, and we'll take it from there. So thanks again for joining me, everyone, and until next time, thanks for watching.